Um, just for introduction, I've, I've worked as a veterinarian a long time in developing countries, and then after that I found that I needed to know more about my own country and worked with dairy farmers in my own country, and I saw then uh, the ideas of how that could be interlinked, so that is what I would like to uh, present to you today. So, just to very give a very brief uh, overview uh, of what has happened in the Netherlands, that 60 years ago, uh, Livestock keeping was very similar to what happens in uh, developing countries today. Eh? Since the 1960s, there have been conscious policies for scale enlargement and intensification. And this was because there was this policy of no more hunger after the Second World War. And so um, farmers were obliged to, uh, to have milk tanks. Every farmer had to have one in his farm. And as a result of that, they also needed to have a big stable in order to fill the tank and to uh, move along in terms of productivity. And there were a lot of conducive policies there. And that is important for you to know. This has not just happened because it would give more income to farmers. There were conducive policies that um, uh, led to this. There was, uh, and especially the first uh, decades, there was an active market protection. There were uh, fixed prices per liter of milk. So the farmer would know that if indeed I get more, uh, have more milk, I would also get a better price. There was also a, a very big access uh, for credit for all farmers that wanted to do this kind of uh, 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 extension. And then there was an active support to the education, extension and research uh, uh, groups. That was lots of money was put into that as well. And there were rigorous disease control programs for the whole country. And there were also subsidies for chemicals like uh, inorganic fertilizer and all that. And of course, there was also like the artificial insemination and breeding policies were stimulated quite intensively, so leading to these uh, Holstein breeds that were actually uh, re-imported. It was the Dutch cows that went to the US, then they made them more dairy and they came back as Frisian Holsteins to our country. And importantly, uh, the land structure was uh, changed dramatically. Where there was water, they make dikes and they would make polders, so have more land, uh, gain land. And the other aspect was there was this, all the small plots were put together and they were, farmers would have plots uh, bringing together in order to facilitate mechanization. And all the natural barriers between the plots were taken away and today farmers are struggling to get these natural barriers back again. So it is important for you to know that this also had a, an enormous amount of subsidies, especially from the EU. And you can see here from the 1983 uh, to 2009, the amount of subsidies in billions. So there was a height in 87, like nearly 4 billion, and this has gradually gone down, but still today our country gets around 1 billion of euros for our farming. It's not because our farmers earn so much, no, it's also they get a lot of European subsidies. So this has resulted in quite a dramatic change. And I want to show you just a few changes. If you look at the yellow part up there, you can see that the number of dairy farms have reduced by uh, nearly 90%. So there used to be 180,000 dairy farms and then now they're only, in 2007, 21,300. So it has reduced nearly 90%. And the milk production, of course, per animal has gone up a lot. You can see that the milk production has gone up uh, from 4,200 liters per cow per lactation to 7,800, uh, 7, and it is even more today. That was in 2007. So the milk production per cow per lactation has doubled in the process. And the other important thing that is uh, important to know that the labor productivity in terms of how much labor you need per liter of milk has increased a lot. Labor productivity per milk per hour was 8 in 1960 and it is 141. So there's much less labor. That explains why there's so reduced number of people working in dairy uh, today. 
But the other element that happened was that um, the quality of the manure of the cattle reduced a lot. They started to be fed with uh, soy and, uh, and maize, and that uh, gave a whole change also in the uh, intestines and the rumen of the cow, and the manure quality uh, changed a lot. It's not solid anymore, but it's very uh, fluid. And one of the things that happened was there was such a big nitrogen ammonia loss to the air that we had a lot of environmental problems, uh, acid rain, things like that. And so the government started to have a lot of environmental regulations. And one of the regulations is that all the manure today cannot be spread just over the field, but it has to be injected by big uh, machines like you see here. The manure is inside, the little wheels, they go into the soil and they will bring all the manure into the soil. All of this has led to a, a drastic reduction of soil fertility, both the, because of the quality and the quantity of the manure. This has resulted in a reduced farm efficiency in terms of nitrogen. In the 1950s, the nitrogen efficiency, or say the use of nitrogen in the farm was very efficient. And because of the introduction of the system, this went down dramatically. And now uh, farmers have started to realize that, so they are starting to have new policies and new ways of farming to get the efficiency back again. But you can see that it is very difficult. It's not easy. It's much easier to lose it than to uh, recover it. So what we can see now, actually, it's a bit of a funny thing, but it's actually what is happening that our uh, animals in our country are fed with soy from uh, like Argentina and, and South America. We have a very intensive system in our country that produces much more than what we need and with a lot of EU subsidies. And then uh, this is being brought to other countries where other farmers uh, may find themselves difficult to compete with that kind of production. So that's the reality and the history uh, as we see today. And you see a beautiful farm. A farmer has uh, 80 cows, or, and, and they're lovely, and the fields are green and beautiful, but there are lots of problems behind that you don't uh, see. And so one, if you have like a very brief overview, you can say that there's a social problem, that uh, over 90 percent has had to stop, so these people had to move out, and where did they go? Then there's also today, the farmers have a very low income, because the income rate per liter of milk is very low, and that's our farmers, in fact, they seem rich, but they are not. And that's why still many farmers have to go out. And the other one is that the income prospects are also uh, difficult because of the the milk quota and the subsidies will be abolished by 2015, so that will change the whole uh, picture also. And young people moving, are moving out of farming. That is, uh, they don't, just don't want it. They see how their parents are struggling and they don't want that for themselves. And there is an increasing con criticism and concern of the general public. They say, well, these farmers, why do they produce? Animal well-being is not good, uh, climate change, all of that. Our farmers are not doing a good job. So this is a kind of a bleak picture, but it's not as bleak as this would seem. What are the ways out? You see that lots of farmers are still moving out. Uh, every day, uh, I believe um, there's five farmers moving out uh, of farm every day in our country. Now there's another uh, option that the farmers, and that is increasingly so, our farmers move out to other countries. They start big farms in Eastern, Euro uh, Eastern Germany, no, Eastern Europe. Uh, uh, yeah, they go all over the place. Portugal. Portugal also, yeah. They go all over the place. They're very, uh, uh, yeah. And of course they bring their system with them. Also because in other countries they don't, you don't have these environmental regulations as much as we have them in our country. Now the third way out is that, uh, that you have an even further scale enlargement. Um, the, the farmers that move out, they will be bought up by their neighbors and there will be a further scale enlargement with a higher technification, um, uh, climate, uh, um, I say the climate resistance floors and uh, they can absorb the greenhouse gases. Um, the, the, the computerized uh, milking systems are coming in. So all of this is also a big trend. 
uh, amongst our farmers. Uh, this is actually a view of where our pig production could be going. Uh, completely transparent for the consumers. Yeah, artificial in a way. So um, this, is, this was actually not a reality yet, but it was like a projection of where it could go. But there are also other ways, and especially based on what farmers themselves are doing. Uh, you see that lots of farmers today, and about 40%, are diversifying their income. Are they looking for other income sources? So you see, for example, here is uh, Farmers Golf. So it's like ecotourism. They have uh, um, people from cities coming and they play golf on the farmer's premises. And of course they drink and they have... Uh, so the farmers get income from that. There's another one here that is a care farm. It's very popular now. You have care for elderly people or yeah, people with needs Disabled. or mentally ill people. They can stay on the farm. And for example, the farmer's wife would be a nurse and she would then take care of these people and the farmer would run his farm. So it would be mixed. And you have also seen that people that go to the farms, it gives good results in terms of care also. Yeah, the farm shops are also becoming increasingly popular, the direct farm. Another way out is that farmers are increasingly looking at how soil fertility can be restored again. And especially in farmers groups, they are looking at how they can do that in a way that's economically also feasible. And they do that by reducing both fertilizer and uh, concentrates and by producing more milk on basis of roughage again.